Are you ready? Well then, I'm teacher Tiffany. Let's jump right in. The very first English idiom is be in a tight spot. Again, be in a tight spot. Excellent. Now this just means to be in a difficult situation. So I want you to think about it like this. Imagine you had a shirt, your favorite shirt. And every time you wore this shirt, you felt good about yourself. But all of a sudden you started gaining weight. So when you go to put on the shirt that you love so much, all of a sudden, ah, it's a little tight. It's, it's difficult to get the shirt on and even more difficult to get the shirt off. Taking the shirt off requires extra energy. It's a difficult situation. That's why we say be in a tight spot. Makes sense, right? Again, a difficult situation. So let me give you some examples and instances. Here's the very first one. You have put me in a tight spot. So I think I need to let you go. This is a very hard situation for me to be in. I, I can't really help you anymore. I need to let you go. You have put me in a tight spot. So I think I need to let you go. Sentence number two, her divorce put her in a tight spot, a difficult situation, but she is doing better now. It makes sense. And sentence number three, Jeremy put me in a tight spot when he brought up the bankruptcy in front of everyone. I didn't want everyone to know about my bankruptcy. So I felt very awkward. It was a difficult situation when Jeremy told everyone revealed, brought up my bankruptcy. Makes sense, right? Again, we say be in a tight spot. Now idiom number two is also a very useful one. Idiom number two is be off the mark, be off the mark. Once again, be off the mark. Excellent. Now this one just means not achieving the desired result due to inaccuracy. Think about it. Maybe you took a test and you expected that you were going to get an A on the test, but then you receive your test results. And instead of an A, you get a C. Wait a minute. That's not the expected result. You were off the mark again, not achieving the desired result due to inaccuracy. Here's the first example sentence. I was really off the mark on my exams. You got that one, right? Number two, his efforts were off the mark. He didn't achieve the desired result. His efforts were off the mark. And finally, the weather forecast was really off the mark today. You know, the weather forecast said that, Hey, it's going to be a sunny day, but it rained all day. The weather forecast was really off the mark today. Make sense. All right, let's move on to English idiom. Number three, English idiom. Number three is bend over backward bend over backward. I want you to repeat after me, bend over backward. Excellent. Now this idiom just means to work extra hard in an effort to make someone happy. Again, you're going the extra mile. You're working extra hard in order to make someone happy. Now think about bending over backward. Oh, it's not really the easiest thing to do. You have to put a lot of effort in order to do it, right? It's just saying that you're working extra hard to help someone else out. In English, we say bend over backward. Now check out this example sentence. Jamie's husband constantly bends over backward for her. He loves her so much, whatever she wants, even though he comes home from work, extremely tired, he will go right back out to get her some flowers to get her the food that she wants. Why? Jamie's husband constantly bends over backward for her. He worked extra hard. He works extra, 
extra hard in an effort to make her happy. All right, sentence number two. I bent over backward for that guy and he still treats me poorly. I worked hard, I put in my best effort and yet he still treats me poorly. Again, I bent over backward for that guy and he still treats me poorly. And what about sentence number three? I only bend over backward for family. I only put in an extra effort for my family. Once again, I only bend over backward for family. Makes sense, right? Okay, let's check out idiom number four. Idiom number four is bite off more than you can chew. Bite off more than you can chew. I want you to repeat after me. Bite off more than you can chew. Excellent. Bite off more than you can chew. Now this just means to make a commitment you cannot fulfill. You tell someone, hey, I got you. I'll make sure to complete all of the things you asked me to complete. And then you realize, oh my goodness, I'm not going to be able to do what I said. I bit off more than I can chew to make a commitment you cannot fulfill. Hey, I'll record a video for you every single day. Wait a minute. I'm a little too busy to do that. I bit off more than I can chew. Make sense? All right, let me give you an example sentence. Here we go. I think I bit off more than I can chew with this new job. I think I bit off more than I can chew with this new job. Next, I need to expand my company, but I don't want to bite off more than I can chew. I want to get bigger, but I don't want to make a commitment that I cannot fulfill. I need to expand my company, but I don't want to bite off more than I can chew. And this one, he is about to bite off more than he can chew by marrying Sabrina. I don't think that's a wise decision. This might be a little bit much for him. He is about to bite off more than he can chew by marrying Sabrina. You got it, right? Okay, now let's move on to idiom number five. Idiom number five is bitter pill to swallow. Bitter pill to swallow. After me, bitter pill to swallow. Excellent. Now, a bitter pill to swallow, this just means an unpleasant happening that is difficult to endure. Something that happens that it's hard for you to accept. It's hard for you to believe that this thing is happening to you. An unpleasant happening that is difficult to endure. It's not easy. A bitter pill to swallow. Now, let me give you an example sentence that will help you understand this idiom. Moving away from family was a bitter pill to swallow. It's so hard to move away from family. For example, you know I lived in South Korea. I lived there for almost 10 years. And during that time, I missed so many family events. It was a bitter pill to swallow. But now I'm home and I'm with my family, so I'm happy. But again, moving away from family was a bitter pill to swallow. Got it? Good. Next, we have this sentence. The pandemic is a bitter pill to swallow, but we will overcome this. Yes, you know about the pandemic that we experienced all around the world, right? With 2020 and the COVID pandemic. The pandemic is a bitter pill to swallow, but we will overcome this. Make sense? All right, and sentence number three. Failing the bar exam yet again was a bitter pill to swallow. I failed again. I gave it my all, but I failed. Failing the bar exam yet again was a bitter pill to swallow. Make sense? All right, excellent. So now you know the five English idioms that you didn't know before, but now you can use them in real life. All right, English idiom number one. Hit the road. Hit the road. Now this just means to start 
a journey again to start a journey so i want you to think about you and your family members or you and your friends maybe every summer you plan a trip and you decide to go to some beautiful location and to get there you decide to drive your car you say come on guys let's go get your bags we are going to hit the road again start a journey makes sense right right when you're about to go you say let's hit the road here's some example sentences here we go sentence number one we need to hit the road early if we want to make it to the beach before it gets crowded hey listen everybody goes to this beach because the weather is nice most of the year but this beach man it just seems like the weather is just perfect whenever we go to this beach the waves are perfect everything is great so we need to get there early because everyone loves it let's hit the road let's start our journey early makes sense right all right here we go sentence number two after a quick breakfast we hit the road we started on our journey to begin our trip across America One more time after a quick breakfast we hit the road to begin our trip across America make sense all right, here we go. Sentence number three. It's time to hit the road and explore new cities. Hey, we have to get out and go. We need to explore new cities. We need to hit the road. Start our journey. Make sense? All right, again, idiom number one, hit the road. I want you to start using it today. If you're watching this video, I want you in the comment section. I want you to use this idiom, make your own sentence using hit the road. Here we go. Idiom number two on the move on the move. Now this just means traveling from one place to another traveling from one place to another. Think about it. If I'm going from Maryland to New York to then Pittsburgh. I am moving from one place to another. I am traveling. I am on the move. Caught it, right? Check out this example sentence. Here we go. Sentence number one. As a travel blogger, my friend is always on the move going from place to place to place from country to country my friend is always on the move and actually this is a true statement one of my good friends she's a travel blog blogger and she is always on the move good job here we go sentence number two we need to pack our bags quickly because we'll be on the move again this evening hey we're going to be traveling from place to place. We need to pack our bags quickly. Make sense. All right, here we go. Next we have sentence number three. My friends are always on the move during the summer. They're always traveling from place to place. In English, we say on the move. You got it. Good. All right. Idiom number three, another great idiom. Number three, catch a ride catch a ride now this just means to get a lift from someone or to go somewhere in someone else's car to catch a ride for example i went on a trip right i went to mexico last year true story i went to mexico with some family and friends now i was going to the airport and my best friend called me. She also went on the trip, but we were on different flights. She said, Hey, Tiff on the way back. Can I catch a ride with you from the airport? We're going to arrive. We're flying into the same airport, but I need a ride. Can I catch a ride with you? Can I go back home with you in your car? I said, sure thing again, catch a ride. You got it right again. This idiom is very natural. You can use it and sound more like a native English speaker. So here we go. Sentence number one. Hey, like my friend said, 
Can I catch a ride with you to the airport or from the airport? Can I catch a ride with you to the airport? Sentence number two. I don't have a car, so I'll have to catch a ride with one of my sisters. I'll have to ride with her to the destination. Sentence number three. If you're going downtown in a few minutes, can I catch a ride with you? Can I go there with you? Can I ride in your car to that place, to that destination? Again, if you're going downtown in a few minutes, can I catch a ride with you? Make sense? All right, good. Now let's move on to idiom number four. Another good one. Take off. Take off. Now this just means to leave a place, especially by plane. Again, to leave a place, especially by plane. We normally say this when we're referring to riding a plane and we're taking off again, leaving a place, especially by plane, for example. <laughs> so I enjoy traveling, right? I travel a lot and I have to travel for work sometimes, right? If I'm traveling to either go to a seminar, to a conference or to speak somewhere. So when I'm on a plane, the plane is sitting right on the ground. I normally have everything set up. I normally fall asleep before takeoff. It's true. When I get on a plane, it's like immediately my body says it's time to fall asleep. Great rest, right? So I normally fall asleep before we leave, before we take off, I'm knocked out. I'm sleep <laughs> makes sense, right? Maybe you're the same way. So here's an example sentence. We're scheduled to take off at 5 PM. So please make sure you're at the airport on time. We're scheduled to take off at 5 PM. Don't be late. Next sentence. The plane is about to take off. So please fasten your seat belts at this time. We're about to take off. So I need you all to please fasten your seat belts. And finally, sentence number three, I'm excited to take off on my first international flight and explore a new culture. I'm sitting on the plane. I can't wait for the plane to take off. Once again, I'm excited to take off on my first international flight and explore a new culture. You got it. All right, good. Now we have one more English idiom, but before I tell you the idiom, I want to remind you, I have a free English newsletter every week, three times a week. I send out a new English resource, a new English lesson via email with tips and tricks, and sometimes some coupons for you and special offers. So if you want to get my free English newsletter via email, all you have to do is hit the link in the comment section or in the description, or you can go to speak English with Tiffany.com forward slash newsletter. I would love to continue helping you throughout the week. All right. So here we go. The final idiom idiom. Number five road trip again, road trip. And it literally just means a long journey made by car. Again, in English, we say road trip. I love road trips. Again, going somewhere by car, listening to music, having long conversations with your friends, stopping at rest stops, getting good food. It's an amazing experience. Road trip. My dream is to go on a road trip across America. America is a huge country and I would love to go on a road trip with friends across America. In English, we say road trip. Make sense. All right, good. Now here's the first example sentence. We're planning a road trip to visit all the national parks. You got it. All right, here next sentence. Our family loves taking road trips during the summer and discovering new places. Again, a long journey made by car. And finally sentence number three, I'm looking forward to our road trip to the beach next month. Oh, I can't wait to go on this journey to the beach next month with my family and friends. I'm looking forward to our road trip to the beach next month. You got it. 
Excellent. All right. So you learned five new English idioms. Idiom number one, light a fire under someone. Once again, after me, light a fire under someone. Excellent. Now this is a very interesting idiom. This idiom literally just means to motivate or inspire someone to take action. For example, I want you to imagine a child, a child that has a lot of homework, but the child only wants to play video games or watch movies. The child does not want to do his homework. This little boy keeps saying, no, I don't want to do my homework. And then his father walks into the room and lights a fire under him and says, listen, if you don't finish your homework, you won't be able to go with us to Disney world immediately. The boy starts doing his homework. Why? His father lit a fire under him. You got it right. Again, it just means to motivate or inspire someone to take action. The little boy didn't want to miss out on the trip to Disney world. Okay. Check out these example sentences using this idiom. Here we go. Sentence number one. The coach's halftime speech lit a fire under the team and they won the game. They were inspired. They were motivated. So they won the game. Next sentence. Number two, the deadline for the project is approaching. We need to light a fire under the team. We need to inspire the team to motivate the team. Why? because the deadline for the project is approaching. Makes sense. Good job. And sentence number three, the inspiring story of the successful entrepreneur lit a fire for aspiring business owners. This has happened to me before reading a story about an amazing entrepreneur or watching a documentary about an amazing entrepreneur actually inspired me, motivated me to keep pushing forward, to keep working hard, to build this business for you. So again, the inspiring story of the successful entrepreneur lit a fire for aspiring business owners. You got it. Excellent. So again, light a fire under someone. Now we have four more amazing idioms that you must know, but I want to remind you after each lesson, you can practice what you've learned. That's right. Practice the idioms. Make sure you under the understand the example sentences. And all you have to do is download the English with Tiffany app. The link is in the description. And once you download the app, you're going to open it. And you'll see the course section and you want to select weekly English fluency lessons with teacher Tiffany. You'll see the list of YouTube lessons and you'll find the one for today, English idioms. And then you'll be able to either watch the video or go directly to the practice lessons. Now these lessons are going to help you understand more of what you learned. You'll be quizzed to see if you're able to put the answers in order, organizing the sentences and so much more. So again, you need to practice after this lesson. So download the English with Tiffany app and the link is in the description. All right. Okay. Let's move on to idiom. Number two, idiom. Number two is pull oneself up by the bootstraps. Once again, Pull oneself up by the bootstraps. Good job. Now you're probably wondering what in the world does this mean? So this idiom just means to improve one's situation through hard work and determination to improve one's situation through hard work and determination. I watched a YouTube documentary about three weeks ago. It was about an individual that traveled to a certain part of India and he was recording the individuals living in this area that was near a field. And these individuals, according to the caste system, were on the lower end of the caste system. But the gentleman that was recording the documentary spoke to another gentleman that used to be in the same community, but 
He pulled himself up by the bootstraps, went to school, got an education, and he was successful. And he decided to come back to his old environment, his old neighborhood to help other people as well. This was a great story, a great documentary about pulling oneself up by the bootstraps. Again, improving one's situation through hard work and determination. Makes sense, right? Excellent. All right, let's check out some example sentences. Sentence number one, after losing his job, he pulled himself up by the bootstraps and started his own business. He said, listen, I lost my job, but I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep moving forward. I'm going to start my own business. He pulled himself up by the bootstraps. Next sentence. Number two, she pulled herself up by the bootstraps and overcame the challenges of being a single mother. So you're seeing now how this idiom can be used in so many different ways. It can apply to so many different real life situations, right? All right. And sentence number three, the athlete pulled himself up by the bootstraps and trained harder to win the championship. Make sense? So again, pull oneself up by the bootstraps. It just means to improve one's situation through hard work and determination. You got it? Excellent. Excellent. Let's move on to idiom number three. Idiom number three, put one's nose to the grindstone. Again, put one's nose to the grindstone. All right. Now this is a very good idiom for you to understand one that you must actually know. So this just means to work hard and diligently on a task. We've been talking about idioms that relate to challenges, right? And this one is similar again, to work hard and diligently on a task. For example, I record English lessons for you to help you improve your English fluency. I also record English lessons for my students in my academy to help them improve their English fluency. So when I have to record, I have to put my nose to the grindstone. I have to work hard and diligently focusing on the task at hand. Makes sense, right? Excellent. Excellent. All right. So let's check out some example sentences. Here we go. The students put their noses to the grindstone and studied for the final exams. The students put their noses to the grindstone and studied for the final exams. Make sense. Excellent. Here we go. Sentence number two, the writer put his nose to the grindstone and finished the book before the deadline. Once again, the writer put his nose to the grindstone and finished the book before the deadline. Finally, sentence number three, the team put their noses to the grindstone. They worked hard and completed the project ahead of schedule. One more time. The team put their noses to the grindstone and completed the project ahead of schedule. You got it. Excellent. So again, idiom number three that you must know, put one's nose to the grindstone. Let's move on to idiom number four. Another great one. Bite the bullet, bite the bullet. Now, remember, we're talking about idioms that relate to challenging situations. So I want you to repeat after me before we go to the meaning, bite the bullet. Good job. Now this just means to face a difficult or unpleasant situation with courage and determination. Think about a fireman. He or she, there are a lot of firewomen as well, have to fight fires in order to save people, biting the bullet, facing a difficult or unpleasant situation with courage and determination. Moving forward, even though it's hard, check out this example sentence. She had to bite the bullet and tell her boss the truth about the mistake she made. 
Not easy, but she bit the bullet and she did it. Second, the athlete had to bite the bullet and play through the pain to help his team win. The athlete had to bite the bullet and play through the pain to help his team win. And finally, sentence three, the company had to bite the bullet and make some tough decisions to stay afloat. The company had to bite the bullet and make some tough decisions to stay afloat. Not easy, but they had to bite the bullet. Makes sense, right? Again, idiom number four, bite the bullet. All right. And now idiom number five, another idiom you must know. Keep one's eye on the ball. After me, keep one's eye on the ball. Excellent. Now this just means to stay focused on the goal or objective to stay focused on the goal or objective. For example, you know that my goal is to help 1 billion English learners around the world, including you speak English with confidence. That is a huge goal. So in order for me to achieve that goal, I have to stay focused. I have to keep my eye on the ball focused on my goal. You got it. Excellent. All right. Here's the first example sentence. The project manager reminded the young man to keep his eye on the ball and not get distracted by minor issues. Stay focused not to get distracted by minor issues. Sentence number two, the athlete kept his eye on the ball and scored the winning goal. He was focused as he came down the court and he shot the ball. He was focused on the goal. He kept his eye on the ball. And finally, the entrepreneur kept her eye on the ball and achieved her business goals. Once again, the entrepreneur kept her eye on the ball and achieved her business goals. You got it. Once again, idiom number five, keep one's eye on the ball. Now, remember these idioms are ones that you must know. They will help you speak English fluently and sound more like a native speaker. Now, before I teach you the idiom, I need to remind you to download the English with Tiffany app. This app will help you learn new words, practice English conversation, improve your English pronunciation, learn more about American culture and so much more. So take out your phone, download the app right now and continue improving your English. The link is also in the description. Now let's jump right in. Here we go. Idiom number one to come to a head. Good after me to come to a head. Excellent. Last time after me to come to a head. Great job. Now this just means to reach a crisis. So think about it like this. Imagine there was a man and a woman, they fell in love and they decided to get married. And in the very beginning, everything was wonderful. They were happy every day. They woke up smiling, but suddenly things started to change. They started to argue more. They started to avoid each other and they started to really hate each other. But you see, when the wife found out that her husband had cheated on her, things came to a head. They argued, they fought, and she said, I want a divorce. Things came to a head when she found out that her husband had cheated on her. You caught it, right? Okay. Again, reached a crisis. She mentioned divorce. So let me give you an example sentence. Here we go. Things haven't been good between us for a while. And this incident made everything come to a head. Just like in this story with the husband and wife, things came to a head. Here's another example sentence. The situation finally came to a head when she failed to show up to school, reached a crisis and sentence number three, 
A situation came to a head when the workers went out on strike. When the workers went out on strike, it reached the crisis level. In English, we say to come to a head. Makes sense, right? Again, try to use the idiom today at least one time. Here we go. Now, idiom number two, turn a deaf ear. Now, after me, turn a deaf ear. Excellent. Again, turn a deaf ear. Good job. Now, this just means to refuse to listen or respond to a statement or request. In English, we say turn a deaf ear. Think about it like this. There's a story that is told to children and the story is called the boy that cried wolf. Now in the story, this little boy, every day he would say, there's a wolf coming. There's a wolf coming. And everyone in the village where he lived would get scared and say, oh no, save the sheep, save the animals. And then they would hear the little boy laughing. <laughs> Just kidding. He was lying. And the boy continued to do this day after day after day. So after a while, the, the people of the village realized that the boy was just lying until one day a wolf actually did come. The wolf was attacking the sheep and the little boy ran to the town and said, a wolf, there's a wolf. He's attacking the sheep. But instead of listening to him, all of the townspeople turned a deaf ear to the little boy's warnings. Why? Because he had lied so many times before they refused to listen this time. Makes sense, right? So let me give you another example sentence that will help you understand this idiom even more. Here we go. He turned a deaf ear to all appeals. He turned a deaf ear. Remember deaf means someone who is unable to hear. So turning a deaf ear means you're not going to listen. Next, the factory owners turned a deaf ear to the demands of the workers. They didn't want to listen. Sentence number three, she turned a deaf ear to her husband's advice and took the job anyway. She didn't listen to her husband. She turned a deaf ear to. So again, this idiom, idiom number two, you must understand this idiom to turn a deaf ear. Now let's move on to idiom number three. Idiom number three is turn the clock back. Turn the clock back. Now this just means to return to a situation that used to exist, to turn to a situation that used to exist. And now to give you an example so that you can understand this better, I am uh, about to be 40 years old. And I still feel good, but I don't feel as good as I did when I was in my 20s. And I remember being in my 20s, I used to run five miles a day. I remember getting on the treadmill and just running for an hour like it was nothing. I could talk to people while watching TV. Everything was good. I was able to do it because I was in good shape. Now I'm in good shape now, but not like when I was in my twenties. So sometimes I would like to turn the clock back to have my 20 year old body back. You got it, right? Maybe you've experienced the same thing. You remember when you were in high school or college and you're like, man, Ooh, now <coughs> every once in a while you have a cough. Maybe your head hurts. Maybe your body aches. Things aren't like they used to be, but if you could just go back in time when you were younger and turn the clock back, you got it right again to return to a situation that used to exist. So let's check out the first example sentence. In some ways we wish we could turn the clock back for a moment, just for a moment to go back in time. Next sentence. If I could turn the clock back and do things differently, I would think about a situation that happened in your past and you regret what you did or what you said you in that situation, you would wish to turn the clock back and you change what you did or what you said. And sentence number three, 
I wish I could turn the clock back to when I was a kid and didn't have any responsibilities, no bills, nothing to worry about. Turn the clock back. Makes sense, right? All right, now let's get into idiom, <laughs> into idiom number four. But before I tell you idiom number four, again, I want to help you improve your English. So if you want daily English lessons, all you have to do is go to dailyenglishlessons.com. I'm teaching you important idioms right now. But if you follow the plan I offer you and so many students at dailyenglishlessons.com, you'll learn even more idioms and improve your English. So again, go to www.dailyenglishlessons.com. Now, idiom number four. Idiom number four is twist someone's arm. Say it after me. Twist someone's arm. Excellent. Last time after me twist someone's arm. Great job. Now this just means to persuade someone to do something that they are or ah, might be reluctant to do. We say you're twisting their arm. Now, <laughs> sometimes parents, right? When they want their children to do their homework, the children complain, I don't want to do my homework. I just want to watch TV or I want to play on my phone. They don't want to do their homework. So sometimes parents have to twist their children's arms. Listen, if you do your homework, I'll buy you ice cream. Now this is not my method, but sometimes parents do this. They have to twist their child's arm again, persuade them to do something. It's not a physical twisting. But this idiom just means to persuade someone to do something like a parent may try to persuade his or her child to do something. Here's an example sentence right here. The first example sentence is I've twisted his arm and he'll get you some tickets. I did it. He's going to do it for you. Now I've twisted his arm next. My wife, my wife really, <laughs> she really had to twist my arm to get me to apologize to my boss. <laughs> I didn't want to do it, but my wife twisted my arm to get me to apologize to my boss. Number three, I wasn't going to come, but George, he twisted my arm. You get it, right? I'm showing you through body language and my facial expressions, how we use this in real life, because I want you to use it as well. Again, twist someone's arm. Now let's check out idiom number five, another important one. Wear several hats. Good. Again, wear several hats. Excellent. Last time, wear several hats. Good job. Now this just means to have many jobs or roles again to have many jobs or roles. And this reminds me of when I lived in South Korea. Again, I lived there for about 10 years. I was a missionary English teacher, loved it, loved my students. I loved it a lot. Now, when I was there initially, I was just a teacher, but as time went on, I was asked to be a manager. So I was an English teacher and then I was a manager. Now as a manager, I had to manage the teachers. I had to uh, give them duties and give them tasks. And then I was also studying Korean. So as a Korean English learner, Korean learner, sometimes I had to be in charge of my group, my study group. So I was a teacher, I was a manager, and also I was a group leader. I was wearing many hats. I had many different responsibilities. You caught it right again, wear several hats. You can also say wear many hats. Now here's the first example sentence I want you to take a look at. The first one is our editorial assistant left the company. So I've been wearing several hats, many different duties or responsibilities. Sentence number two, I work from home, so I'm able to wear several hats. I'm able to do many different things. And sentence number three, after he left, she had to wear several hats. Again, she had to do many different things in English. We say wear several hats. Makes sense, right? 
Hey, I am going to teach you English idioms that you need to know in order to communicate properly in a business environment. Are you ready? Do you have your pen out? Well then, I'm teacher Tiffany. Let's jump right in. The very first idiom you must know is ballpark figure. Once again, ballpark figure. Excellent. Now this just refers to an approximate or a rough estimate. Think about this. You're in a meeting and you're discussing a project that you and your team are working on. Now the exact budget for the project might be around $957,000 and 50 cents. That's the exact amount. But the person up front speaking about the project could say, mm, we need, let's say, I'll, I'll give you a ballpark figure of about a million dollars. You see a rough estimate or an approximate makes sense, right? This is a very commonly used idiom in the business environment. So let me give you some example sentences that will help you use this idiom. First, can you give me a ballpark figure of how much the project will cost? That's related to the example I gave you before, right? Check out this example sentence. The salesman gave me a ballpark figure an estimate for the price of the car. So when you're going to get a car, they can give you a ballpark figure. And finally, this example sentence. We need a ballpark figure of the expenses before presenting the proposal. You got it? Good. So once again, ballpark figure. Excellent. Now the second one is also very important. The second English idiom for the business environment is cut corners. Good. Again, after me cut corners. Great. Now what you're noticing is that these idioms are made up of words that you've probably heard before, but when you put the words together, they take on an entirely different meaning. So cut corners. It means to do something in a cheaper or quicker way, often sacrificing quality. So I want you to think about this situation. You want to get a home built. You want a home for your family and you want it to be absolutely beautiful, but you also want the home to be safe. If there's a natural disaster, you want to know that this home will be sturdy and will keep your family safe from the natural disaster. But if you hire a company that is known for cutting corners, you know, in the back of your mind that they are going to use cheap material materials that actually will not make your house sturdy. So you don't want a company that cuts corners. You got it. Excellent. Again, cut corners. Now check out this example sentence. Don't cut corners when it comes to the safety of your employees. You got it. Check out the second example sentence. The company decided to cut corners to meet its production deadline. And finally, this example sentence, it's important not to cut corners during the research phase of a project. You got it again to do something in a cheaper or quicker way, often sacrificing quality. You want to make sure you're not cutting corners. All right, let's move on to number three, another very important idiom. This idiom is get down to business. Good. Again, after me, get down to business. Great job. Now we use this English idiom in the business environment. When we are trying to say we want to focus or start focusing on the main topic or task at hand. Perfect example for you right now. I am actually in my office recording this English lesson for you. That's right. Specifically for you. Now I had to make sure the lighting was right. Make sure my camera lens was clean. Make sure all of the lighting behind me was set up perfectly. Right. And then I had to get down to business. I had to hit record in order to make this lesson for you. 
Get down to business. Focus on the main topic or the task at hand. You got it? Excellent. All right. Check out these example sentences. Here we go. Let's get down to business and discuss the details of the contract. Now, I really want you to start using this English idiom because we use it so much as native English speakers. This is a very commonly used English idiom. So if you want to sound more natural and to speak English with more confidence, you need to start using this idiom today. All right. Check out this other example sentence. After some small talk, the team finally got down to business in the meeting. They had a little bit of conversation, a little small talk, and then they got down to business. And next, what about this example sentence right here? We only have a limited amount of time. So let's get down to business. You got it. I love it. I love it. Now we're going to move on to our next one. Idiom number four, but I do want to remind you. I am teaching you these idioms, but it's very important to practice what you learn. So I want you to remember to download the app English with Tiffany. The link is right in the description. And when you download the app, you'll be able to practice what you are learning today. Go to weekly English lessons with teacher Tiffany, and you'll see today's lesson, right? And you'll be able to practice to see if you really understand each of the idioms. So once again, the link is in the description. If you're watching this video, or you can just again, go and download the English with Tiffany app and you'll find the lesson for today and be able to practice putting sentences together and so much more. All right, let's move on to number four that rhymed. I liked it. Here we go. Number four, English idiom. Number four, hit the ground running, hit the ground running. Now this just means to start a new project or job energetically and without any delays hit the ground running. Now for me, I'll use myself as an example. Again, I enjoy recording these lessons for you and I've gotten so many messages from you all and probably from you too, letting me know that you love the passion I have for helping you learn English. It's real. I really enjoy this. So normally once a month, when I come to my office to record these lessons, I make sure everything is set and I hit the ground running. I go right through recording the lessons, making sure everything is perfect for you without any delays. Every Sunday, putting a lesson up just for you. I hit the ground running. You got it. Excellent. Check out this example sentence. Here we go. The new employee hit the ground running and quickly adapted to the company's work environment, fell right in line and did what everyone else was doing. Next, we have this one. We need someone who can hit the ground running in this fast paced industry. And finally, the team decided to hire an experienced consultant to hit the ground running on the project. We need to get started and move forward without delay. Again, hit the ground running. You got it. Listen, you are getting some gems from this lesson because these idioms are literally used by native English speakers. So are you ready to go to number five? You can answer. Yeah, let's move on to number five. Here we go. Number five is learn the ropes, learn the ropes. Now this is another important and very useful English idiom, especially in the business environment. It just refers to becoming familiar with the details and practical knowledge of a job or task. I remember my assistant started working with me over a year ago. Amazing young woman, amazing young woman. And if she's watching this, thank you so much. I appreciate you. An amazing woman. Now, when she first joined my team, she didn't know anything. She was very skilled and very talented, 
but she had to learn the ropes. I had to teach her how to do certain things. I had to show her where certain files were. Why? Because she didn't know it before. So I had to teach her the main things she needed to know all of the details and the practical knowledge. She had to learn the ropes. Now she's an expert. Now she's absolutely amazing. All right. You got it. Excellent. All right. Check out this example sentence. The intern will spend the first few weeks learning the ropes of the company's procedures. You got it next. Here we go. It takes time to learn the ropes of managing a team effectively. And finally, we have this one right here. The new hire is still learning the ropes. So we need to provide guidance and support. You got it. So once again, learn the ropes. All right, let's move on to number six. Again, you are getting so much knowledge, so much information during this lesson. Here we go. Number six, call the shots. Good again, call the shots. Yes, you got it. Now this just refers to being in a position of control or having the authority to make the decisions. So again, I'll bring it back to me, your teacher, because you know me well, right? So I'm running a business, the speak English with Tiffany Academy and this YouTube channel and the Instagram channel I have, I'm running these things and the app. So I call the shots, which means I have to make sure my team members have what they need. I have to make sure they know exactly what needs to be done on a daily basis. So again, calling the shots means the person in control who has the authority to delegate or let people know what they need to do. Now my team members, they are awesome. They are amazing. So I just need to let them know what they need to do and they all do it well. Thank you guys. I appreciate you. All right, here we go. Sentence number one, ask the project manager. She calls the shots on all major decisions. Next we have this one. The CEO is the one who calls the shots in this company. Hey, He's the one in charge. She's the one in charge. He calls the shots. She calls the shots. The person in the position of authority. And finally, we have this one. The team leader has the final say and calls the shots during team meetings. Make sense? Excellent. So don't forget this one. Call the shots. All right. Let's look at number seven. Another very important English idiom cut to the chase again, cut to the chase. Now this is once again, another amazing and very useful English idiom, specifically in the business environment. It means to get to the point or get to the important part without wasting time. Now you can use this English idiom in other situations, but we are specifically speaking about business right now. Okay. So get to the main point. What's the main part. So again, let's go back to that meeting environment. You're discussing this project that has a ballpark figure of $1 million. You remember that right from the beginning of the lesson. So you're sitting in this meeting and now you raise your hand and say, Hey, so let's cut to the chase. What do we have to do to make sure this project is a success? Let's cut to the chase. Let's get to the main or more or most important point. You got it. Excellent. All right. Check out these example sentences. Here we go. Let's skip the small talk and cut to the chase. What's the main issue we need to address? You got it. Excellent. All right. Sentence number two, the presenter decided to cut to the chase and focus on the key findings of the research. Hey, let me just cut to the chase and get to the key findings of the research, the main points. And finally, number three, the meeting was running behind schedule. So the manager asked everyone to cut to the chase. Hey, Let's just focus on the main points because we don't have a lot of time. Let's cut to the chase. You make sense. 
Excellent. I really hope you are writing these down and don't forget again, you need to go to the app English with Tiffany so you can practice right after this lesson. Again, you can watch another English lesson or you can go directly to the app and start practicing. All right, let's move on to number eight. Number eight is think outside the box. One more time. Think outside the box. Good. Now this just means to think creatively, unconventionally or beyond traditional boundaries. You're not thinking like everyone else. For example, you know that one thing I say all the time is I don't teach grammar. I have never taught you grammar on this YouTube channel. And if you're listening to this from my uh, podcast, you know, I've never taught grammar. Now grammar is important. But I've mentioned that for intermediate and advanced level learners, you have to study in a different way. That is thinking outside the box because my students that study with me, oh, their grammar does improve, but I never teach them grammar. Intriguing, right? All right. So again, thinking outside the box, thinking creatively, unconventionally, or beyond traditional boundaries. Now I have a story at the end, so don't miss story time about one of my previous coworkers at NASA, a man that thought outside the box. So let me give you some example sentences and don't go anywhere. You don't want to miss that story. So first example sentence to solve this problem, we need to think outside the box and consider unusual solutions. Next, the creative team is known for its ability to think outside the box and come up with innovative ideas. And finally, the company encourages employees to think outside the box and propose new strategies. You got it? Yes. Think outside the box. Now, number nine, another amazing and very important English idiom, keep someone in the loop again. Keep someone in the loop. Good job. Now this just means to inform someone and include them in the communication or decision making process. All right. You have a meeting and there's one coworker that was unable to attend the meeting, but he tells you, Hey, I'm not going to be at the meeting, but can you give me all the information after the meeting? Please keep me in the loop. Please let me know what's going on. Keep me in the loop. Make sense? Yes. One of my students, I taught him this idiom as well, and he started using it immediately. Okay, Tiff, please keep me in the loop. And I loved it. Why? Because he sounded like a native English speaker. This is how we as native English speakers speak. So you, if you start using these idioms, you'll start sounding like me, like your teacher. All right. Here's the example sentence. All right. The first one, please keep me in the loop about any updates or changes to the project timeline. Next we have this one as the team leader, it is important to keep everyone in the loop regarding important decisions. And finally, the manager kept the entire department in the loop about the upcoming changes. You got it. Yes. Keep someone in the loop. Excellent. All right. Now we have number 10, the final one. And one of the most important ones, this one is stay on top of something, stay on top of something. Good job. Now this just means to stay informed and in control of a situation or task. You're staying on top of it. You have this big project you're working on and you have many things to do in order to complete the project, but you're not going to miss the deadline. Why? Because you're staying on top of everything. You know, which tasks need to be done today. You know, which tasks need to be done tomorrow. You are staying on top of the project. Make sense. All right. Excellent. Check out this example sentence. It's important to stay on top of industry trends to remain competitive. Next we have this sentence. 
the project manager needs to stay on top of the project's progress and deadlines. You got it? Excellent. And finally, we have this one. I'm constantly checking my emails to ensure I stay on top of any urgent requests. You got it? Excellent. So once again, stay on top of something. Now, I really hope you enjoyed the lesson today. I hope you learned a lot and I hope you start using these idioms. My voice cracked. <laughs> I hope you start using these idioms starting today. Remember, they'll help you to sound more like a native English speaker. I will talk to you in the next lesson, but as always, remember to speak English. You still there? <laughs> you know what time it is. Let's go. It's story time. Hey, I said it's story time. <laughs> All right. So I told you earlier during the lesson when I was teaching you the idiom, think outside the box that I had a coworker. Now I want to take you back way back about 15 or so years ago. I used to work at NASA. Great job, great boss, great coworkers. And while I was at NASA, so my schedule was 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. I'm an early bird, so I absolutely loved that schedule. I had enough time to get all of my work done and leave at 3 p.m. to get home, take a nap, and still had time to hang out in the evenings. It was a great schedule. Now, during my time working at NASA, I met many amazing individuals. I mentioned to you in the past, in one of my past story times, there was a guy I worked with. He was the first individual I had worked with that could speak Korean. His wife is actually Korean, so we had many conversations. Extremely intelligent. He was a genius when it came to databases and computers and coding. Amazing but he wasn't the only amazing man that I worked with. There were other females I worked with too that were amazing. There was one guy that I worked with. He was very mild mannered. He was quiet, but if you talk to him, he could hold a really good conversation. And I really liked him. So one day I just happened to stop by his desk. I was walking back to my desk and he was sitting at his desk. So I stopped just to have a short conversation with him. And he was one of the designers slash illustrators in our department. And his work literally would blow my mind. Not only was he so creative, he always thought outside of the box, but the quality of his work really blew my mind. Now, I am also an artist, so I love things that look beautiful, things that are well designed and well laid out, which is why his work caught my attention. So I was sitting talking to him as he was working on a project and he was showing me different things he used and different color combinations. And I asked him, I said, wow, how did you learn how to be such an amazing illustrator? How did you get this good? He said, well, Tiff, I actually uh, worked somewhere else before working here. And I said, oh, where did you work? He said, Disney slash Pixar. I said, what did you just say? He said, yeah, I actually used to work for, I'll say Disney. I used to work for Disney. I used to do some animation for Disney. And in that moment, I realized that the individuals working at NASA and for NASA that I was surrounded by, they were not regular people. They were the individuals that were at the top of their fields, individuals who were so talented while at the same time being super humble. He was the most humble guy I had ever met at that time. And he just told me I used to work for Disney. So of course he already had my respect, but my respect level even went higher when he told me that I tried to sit with him even more just to ask him for tips on making uh, better visuals. And he was so kind. We had great conversations and I'll never forget him because not only was he talented, not only was he able to think outside the box, he was also a humble and extremely kind individual. If you're watching this video, hey, long time no see, hit me up. I'd love to catch up. 
All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this short story and maybe you know someone else that you work with that is absolutely amazing, very humble, but extremely amazing and an expert in their field. I'll talk to you in the next lesson. Have a wonderful week.